Hey y'all, welcome to the Clock Tower. I'm Colton here with Brandon, but it's not the Brandon that you know. Brandon Raderink is the tournament organizer at our locals, Legend Sports and Games in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we asked him to come on today to talk about an alternate format that we've been running in the shop a couple of times. It's really fun. And he's been the brains behind it. Brandon, first of all, thank you. Welcome. Oh, hello. Thanks for having me on the Clock Talk. So we have started doing draft format at the shop. We've done it a couple of times, mm -hmm. um, once with Kaguya and once with Hololive. I was there for the Hololive draft a couple weeks ago. And the format's really fun. I think it's a really interesting way to play Weiss. And I wanted to bring you on here so that you can kind of talk about it. Some people have kind of flirted with draft format a couple of times in years past. Like if you search Weiss Force draft, you find a couple of like dead links to, you know, long deleted blogs and like a Reddit post or two, but nothing super substantial. For those who maybe don't know, can you tell us generically in a trading card game what a draft format is real quick? So drafting format essentially is taking booster packs and then between you and the people at your table, building decks out of those packs. You'll open your first pack, you'll take a card, and then you'll pass it to your left or to your right, and then you'll get a already opened pack from the player next to you, You'll take a card and you continue to pass like that, creating a more dedicated, maybe more, more dedicated or thoughtful sealed format versus just opening like six packs and trying to build a deck out of it. Yeah, draft is particularly popular in Magic. That's where I think most drafting happens. You'll see it. I think it's the product was designed for it, if I recall, or like it used to be designed for it. Yeah, I, I think that Magic was the first game to try this format, and I think it, it works obviously really well with Magic because you can uh, get basic lands from anywhere, mm -hmm. so you just kind of, you take whatever cards you want, and you know there are only five different kind of casting costs you know, in terms of color, mm -hmm. so it works pretty well in Magic because you can kind of synergize with you know different things and all that. With Weiss, however, it's a little bit different because you have things like combos and, you know, color, affili color affinities, things like that. So this draft format where you open a pack, you take a card, pass it, and then, you know, take a card from the next pack that's been passed to you, etc. Just go around until you, know, you empty the pack and then you open a new one, you keep going. How does that work in a Weiss context where you have things like combos that you have to be aware of? So the first thought we had for this one was that CX combos are very powerful, but also very like hard to work around. So the way we had it with this one is that when you play a climax, you would just declare the name that you want this climax to now be. So it's like, cool, all right, we're drafting fate. I'll declare the name of my level one gold bar combo. And now I can use this cool double R soccer that I pulled, which in most like drafting or even sealed circumstances, if I open an entire box, I'm not guaranteed to have the pieces to do that. Exactly. So we thought it opened up the game, uh, just the format, a lot by being able to like, oh, cool, I can draft all of these cards with Climax combos, and then I can play any Climax, redeclare the name on play, and now I have a cool level zero combo or a cool finisher combo, and I don't need to like tunnel vision draft for my specific pieces. Right, and what we ended up doing actually was, so we had eight packs that were sitting mm -hmm. in front of us, and... Every time you opened a new pack and you got to, you know, take your first card, you also took the CX that was in the back. Yes. And that you just set that aside into your pile that became yours. So we didn't really draft CXs except for those packs that have an extra CX, and usually those just kind of were passed around until they were the last card in the pack. Mm -hmm. Because the combos, like the, the, the specific CX didn't matter, because that was... Like you said, that's just, that's too much to try to, you know, hopefully I draw the, you know, hopefully I find the, the specific bar that goes at the specific level one. Yeah, it creates a lot of dead cards in your packs if you suddenly can't use any of your CX combos or anything like that. Um, it's also kind of inherently balancing as well, because the odds of you pulling more than one copy of the double R level one or the double R level three combo that you really want in eight packs is not super high. So you're probably only going to have one copy of this card. So even if you can just you know, slam any CX you want over and over again, you're still only getting probably one combo per turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at best. And that's, yeah, if it's all from the same box, or if we weirdly cheated, like, oh, four packs and four packs, like, the, the odds of getting two copies of a level one combo would be insanity. So stepping 
back a little bit, taking a step back from some of the more some of the details. What does deck construction look like? Because it's not eight climaxes and fifty cards. No, we uh, we tried that initially, and we realized that just slamming climaxes makes that way too good because there's no uh, there's very little deck speed in a in a draft format. So we ended up deciding on a thirty six card deck that included six climaxes. The ratio is changed, not drastically, but slightly, so that you're going to get more cancels in deck one. Yes, yeah, the idea was to not get... I know when we uh, when we did the Kaguya draft initially, we did actually go for the, the 50 and 8, like normal Weiss was. And I recall one of the games I played, I was quite lucky and opened Climax up. I had every turn, so my turn 2, 3, and 4, I just got the drop Climax and sling, swing for 3, swing for 3, swing for 3. My opponent had drawn all the CXs, so I was just sticking him for damage quite badly and like the guy had fun but i was like ah this this poor lad like he's getting bodied by basic mechanics that's no good we don't like that in a draft format he couldn't help it yeah there's not a whole lot that you can do in a draft like to some extent like the the choices you make like obviously matter you know you want to draw mill when you find it things like that but realistically like in a, in a deck that I'm building, I'm going to play three Brainstormers, I'm going to play some Cheeries, I'm going to play some maybe some Rizes, or, you know, a milling combo that I try to get three lanes of. Mm -hmm. And in this, it's like, I got a Brainstormer, maybe two, mm -hmm. and, like, I found a single Rize, and I have a, a level one combo that, like, it's a cigarettes combo, so it mills me two, like... And you had to work for those on top of that. Exactly. So having the smaller deck allows you to really, it, it does allow you to get through the deck faster. So you also get out of that really bad first deck and into a better, uh, a more compressed deck. Because mm -hmm. one of the things I also noticed with the format is stock is less valuable, it, just in general. Like, because you're creating a lot of stock that you aren't necessarily spending mm -hmm. because you don't have a bunch of copies of expensive stock effects. You might have like a level three combo that requires you to pay two pitch one or you might have a 1-1 one, one that you play, but you're not trying to field multiple copies of costed characters very often. So, like, it's not that difficult to generate the resources that you need, but it also allows you to actually compress through stock as well, mm -hmm. which I think, like, you know, it makes it so that your next, you know, your, your, your second, maybe third deck are also better than they were in deck one. Oh, certainly, yes. Especially with like a lack of things like stock swap in a sealed format, because that would depend entirely on the set. And then, did the player like? Does the player know the set well enough to know that green is stock swap? So I'm going to draft green, even if my first double R was red, or things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah, and even then, like, you still have to find the stock swap, and then you have to play the stock swap. Right, um, you need the you, pieces. You, like, there's not I. I found a single, I, I found a drop salvage. I don't think I, I, I didn't have a drop search. I had a drop salvage in my draft, in my hollow live cards. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's not easy to like fix for something specific. Uh, you made a change regarding color identity and climaxes. You basically said that any climax can be played at any time. Uh, regardless of color, because you don't really have great control over what color climaxes you get, because you're only getting you know, the ones that are in your packs. In spite of that, every card keeps its trigger. So, like when you slam, say a, uh, so if you're playing like the Oski combo, for example, if you you slam a, a choice, you go this choice has the name, you know, the name of the Oski climax, but it doesn't become a standby. And I think that that's a really important distinction. Yeah, it allows you to see some really interesting interactions you wouldn't normally get. Like, in your normal, like, say I, I would normally play 8 standby hollow live. Okay, cool. Well, here's these combos, but now I suddenly have, like, a choice trigger, a pants trigger, and a gold bar trigger out of nowhere. And it's like, oh, now this is kind of interesting. Like, how does this feel? Like, it creates this different feeling format as well versus just, oh, I'm playing 8 standby hollow live. Now it's like, oh, I'm playing, you know, two gold bar, one choice, two pants, if I'm lucky, you know. Yeah. One book, stock soul, door? Oh, why not? You got a door. You got door hollow live. Well, I guess there's only six, so I named two extra. But yeah, like you're, you're choicing. It's it's not the greatest. And I think that's maybe one thing I would look into. Like, oh, is that something we'd want to change uh, going forward? Like for magic, you're able to bring your own lands to a draft format. You know, so I can right. play my fancy full art magic lands that I've paid too much money for. 
it's like, oh, would we want to allow something silly like, oh, you can, you know, bring your own climaxes and play three copies of something, you know, like up to three. But it's it's also there's there's kind of a joy and funness of just here's my here's the climax triggers I got. You know, I mm-hmm. I spent the quote unquote spent the extra. I didn't grab a common or an uncommon or maybe even the rare in my pack because I wanted like this booster pack opened a choice and a standby and I wanted both of those. So I grabbed those in my yep. first pack. Yep. But. Yeah. And that's definitely something you can do. I had one standby and I think I actually ripped it when I didn't have a target, which is like, are you kidding me? Like really out of all these cards? Right. Like that's the worst. But, it, but at the same time, like, you know, things like standby suddenly become their value is very different, right? Because like all of a sudden you're not standby out a two, two, Right, because you're not planning on ripping the standby, so you probably aren't sleeving the two two. Most likely. Instead, you're you know you, you when you when you hit the standby, it's like okay, well, what's in there? What's my free plus? You know, what card do I put on the board for free mm-hmm. that I otherwise might not get access to? And sometimes it might be your level three combo, like the one level three combo that you found in pack one. But as much as like we're kind of talking about it, like it's a low power format, which it is inherently kind of a low power format, it's really fun because. It's very different. You get to do something very unlike what you're used to. Like, and that's obviously like, you know, the, the sealed versus constructed kind of, you know, the, the way that those work already, right? In, in, any, in any card game. The sealed experience is inherently different because it requires you to make decisions on the fly and, you know, you, you aren't just taking the double R, right? Like, oftentimes you are, but maybe you're not. You know, you have to take the card that is, that is best for you, but also, like, there's something of maybe I want to play this card in the future. Maybe this card doesn't work well in my deck as constructed, but I'm going to play this deck eventually. And, you know, so I'm going to take this card that, you know, will help me quite a bit in the future kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, you get the, the kind of the best part of opening packs in a lot of ways, because whenever you open a pack, you get the best card in that pack, basically. Like if you pull an SP, the SP is yours, right? If you open an SP, then then you got it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, as the packs get passed around, like if there are uncommons and commons that maybe you want, but the person next to you doesn't, you're able to take some of those things that you otherwise might have missed out on and pass on things that, you know, somebody else might want more than you. Well, and it's the fun nature of it that like at the end of your eight packs, you have 72 cards and what is it? Eight of those are climaxes. Eight of those are potentially double R's. But then you're still stuck with the other, what, 56 packs or 56 cards that are like, yeah. these are commons and uncommons. Cards that I would never potentially look at while deck building for a set. Because like I look at the list and I say like, oh, here's this rare. Here's this rare. Especially if it's a set that expands uh, over multiple releases. But in a, in a draft format, you're like, oh, I've never played for Kagi. It's like, oh, I've never played this level zero combo. That I now have. Okay, sick. Like, off off we go. Like, I, I guess I'm using that today. And you can see these cards and go like, oh, this is a really neat design. Will I play it in a proper constructed format? Mm, I wasn't going to before, but maybe after using it in draft, I can go, oh, hey, I'm getting experience with cards I've never used before. How can I maybe shift this over to constructed or, you know, something like that. The harsh reality of any set is that two-thirds of it is basically, I don't want to say unplayable, but unplayed. It is proxy back. You know, exactly. Like, most of the cards in a play set don't get sleeved up. They go in the box, they stay in the box. Mm -hmm. So it is cool to kind of be required now to look at these cards more closely. Like, I found something, I found a Rize that, like, was not very good. It, like, was never going to see any play in any actual Hollow Live deck. But in a situation where you need some fixing and some mill, because this is draft format and, you, you know, those are harder to come by, the fact that I was required, essentially, to find those profiles that were kind of hidden gems in this format made it so much more interesting. Like, you lo- you open a pack differently, right? Mm-hmm. Like, when you open a pack normally, you're kind of, you know, you know, sometimes you might just skip right to the back and see what the rare is, right? Like there's a there's that temptation to do that so with this it's like every card matters right like i'm not just looking to see if i got the r like when four commons are passed to you okay which of these commons works best with what i'm doing like for me i got the laplace in pack one and i 
did not get another. I got one. I got a Laplace, and I got, I think, a green one. I forget. Mm -hmm. uh, was it Fubiki? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But I got another. And those were it. Those are the only two, like, actual finishers I had in the entire deck. And it was great. Like, I'm sculpting towards those, right? I'm trying to find them. And, like, I when you, when you get one, you hold it, right? I think that that makes it... I think it makes it interesting. It's a different way to play. But I think that there is, like you're saying, there's there's a joy to it because it's so different. Mm -hmm. It forces you to play the game a little differently. It forces you to look at these cards that you otherwise would completely ignore and go, what's the value in here? What can I find here that I would otherwise uh, that I would otherwise miss? No, because I think the big reason we wanted to start trying to do draft was like we'd have all these releases come out. So like what what dropped recently that no one cares about? Review Starlight came out. Hey. And like, unless you're a diehard review Starlight fan, which it sounds like I have one on the other end, like, no one cares. No one cares. It's not going to do anything at a regional event. Like, especially this set. The next set's going to be a lot better, but this set, not a chance. Right, and it's like maybe it's something I need to be aware of. Like, oh, this could be a weird round one, round two, maybe round three pairing at a regional event. Like, mm -hmm. if some guy's really running hot, but like. I could probably never know what a single review Starlight card or deck does, and I would be just as happy. But mm -hmm. for draft format, like, hey, here's a whole set I've never read before. I know nothing about. Oh, mm -hmm. we have weird mechanics in this. Oh, that's kind of neat. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'll pick up the set or like the amount of sets I think I've picked up from the. Uh, oh, I like how the art looks. I did that with uh, with yeah. Saikano. Where it's like, I've never watched Saikano. And then I watched like five minutes and I was like, maybe I shouldn't have bought this set. But uh, it was like, oh, I like the, like, I like the way the art looks. I like the way the characters look. You know, like, hey, this seems fun. And I think the idea of drafting is it like it puts cards in people's hands that they maybe wouldn't have had before because, yeah. no, I'm not going to spend, you know, $300 on a play set. But hey, it's the weekend. I'll pay, you know, X dollars to draft with everyone. Why not? Draft format by itself is fun. And also, something you can do is, like, if someone at your locals is buying a case or is buying several boxes of something, like, run a draft format with that, mm -hmm. you know? Like, just, you don't get to keep the cards at the end, you know, if someone else bought these boxes, but, like, just run it because it's fun. Yeah, You know, it's, it's just, an, it's, and you only get so many opportunities to play a real sealed experience. Like, take those opportunities. It's just, it's a really interesting and unique way to play. And I'm really excited that we've started exploring this space because now, like, I want to go to every draft we do, even for the sets that I don't care about. Like, I'm not buying Azure Lane, mm -hmm. but I know Brayden is. So I'm going to be like, hey, Brayden, everything I, uh, everything I draft, it's yours. Okay, but like, let's be fair. What does Brayden not buy? Brayden pretty much buys everything. Right. But you know what? Honestly, it helps that Brayden owns pretty much every set because then I get to practice against every set. Because he plays it. He plays all of it. He sleeves mm -hmm. it. He plays it. So, you know, no one can ever accuse Brayden of just buying and hoarding in boxes. He uh, he sleeves everything. He does. He does. Dozens of decks at any given time. I think he saved me from No Game, No Life. And I use saved very intentionally. Because I think at the shop, I opened like four boxes. For the, no, I opened two boxes for the bands to sell as singles, and we got the, uh, oh, what's her name? The Angel Chica. Uh, I can't think of her name, but we got her SP, and I was like, oh, this is really, really nice. Mm, maybe I want this set now. Text Braden within 10 minutes. He's over there. I'll take four boxes, including that. <laughs> Excellent work, Braden. Proud of you, buddy. Yeah, if I ever if I ever open anything, like uh, I actually opened the, I opened the Botan SSP during the draft. Oh yeah, yeah, you did. I I opened it and I was like immediately I'm like, well, Braden will buy this. So what? Now you got free food for every regionals trip you go on for like the next year and a half. And and that's the other thing. Like I don't buy sealed product, mm -hmm. like because frankly, like I can't justify the expense of sealed product because I don't make a ton of money. Well, and there's such a threshold you need for it as well. Like if you're not cracking, shoot, like four to six boxes like you're not gonna see your sets you're and then you gotta go on the singles market and then that takes time and you're like ah, i should just bought a play set from a sketchy guy online or a not sketchy guy online some of those guys are very nice well i bought my uh heaven's field play set from you because you cracked a case that i did because i'm a to and i can do that sometimes for me buying play sets is normal um i'm like i'm gonna single out review starlight 
there's no point in me buying a bunch of boxes for the one deck that I want to run in Review Starlight. So here's a random thing I have. I feel like Weiss is one of the few games I've... This is totally off topic. Weiss is one of the few games where, like, playset buying is weirdly accepted. Yeah. Like, I feel like in no other game... Like, may, maybe Cardfight Vanguard. There's a nation split people will do. But, like, people don't do that for Pokemon. People don't do it for Magic. I don't think. Yeah. Like, people aren't doing it for Yu-Gi-Mons. Really. I, yeah, like, I don't know if people selling nation splits for, like, One Piece or Digimon. You could, I guess. But, oh, no. I find it really interesting that, like, Weiss is one of the few games where, in at least from my perspective, as a as a guy who runs and works at a store where people where customers will come on in and say like, Hey, uh, this set's coming out. Can I buy a play set from you? And I go like, uh, maybe, I don't know. let me check what we got. Like, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And it's, you know, that's one of the reasons why Weiss is so hard to sell in stores is because mm-hmm. of the, you know, the set by set nature of the whole thing. I and mean, that's one of the reasons why draft is so unique in Weiss too, is because in magic, you could take, a random box of any set and draft it because all five colors are there. Yep. You know, it's the same five colors that it's been since Alpha. Yep. Whereas in Weiss, it's like, you know, if you if I open Konosuba, like, I'm only playing it in other Konosuba. You know, there are only three sets that are, you know, that are legal to play under this banner, so... Right, yeah. Weiss is one of those weird games where, like, oh, I'm giving out packs for prize support. Boo! Boo! Yeah. <laughs> What what if it's a pack you like? Or I already have the play set, or you know, pull in for foils at that point, which is fine. Just like yeah, no, it's it, it's real though. Like it it does feel kind of like after you already have your play set to open a pack and be like, well, I guess I'm hoping I get an SR. Like mm-hmm. my one in sixteen foil. Yeah, for me, being able to draft is an opportunity for me because like instead of singling it out or buying a play set, I'm actually able to open sealed product and maybe I do get something really cool, right? Like, because that's what I did for Hololive. I'm like, I knew I was going to build Hololive, specifically, like, the English stuff. And I'm like, you know, before I buy my singles, I'll do this draft event, and I'll see what I get. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got some stuff. Like, I was actually... And and the other thing is, you can trade with people afterward. Like, I got um, the SR Mume and a couple other things that one of the other guys at our locals wanted, because he was, you know, he's building a lot of it. And I didn't really need any of it, but he already had his place out of Gura's. And I obviously I didn't have any yet, so I'm like, he was like, I'll I'll take you know those two double R's and that SR for a Gura, and I'm like, sweet, sure, I'm not gonna play these cards, and he already had his Guras, so like, it just it works, you know, like there are so many really cool things about, um, you know, you can get the cards that you're looking for, you know, it's like it's it's that nice space in between, like you get the you get the opening experience of packs, which is just it's really fun to rip packs. There is nothing like pulling the lever on the gotcha. There's Mm -hmm. nothing like it. It's like, it has kept casinos going all these years. You gotta pull the lever. Maybe it works this time. Mm -hmm. So like, it's fun to be able to open packs and see what you get. But you also get to walk out of there with cards you actually want instead of just a pile of cards you happen to open. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you can open eight duds, but you can get the R or the, the uncommon or the common passed to you that you need. And sometimes the double R, like I got a couple of packs where like I was given the double R because the person needed the R or they needed a common, mm-hmm. you know, they needed something else out of that pack. So I got to take the double R. So like, you know, it's a really good way, I think, to open product, not just to like play as a format, but it's also a good way to open product because you're more likely to get the stuff that you actually want, but you also still have an equal shot of maybe opening something that's, you know, super impactful or just super rare. While still doing something different for that night. Yeah, and I think that that's the other thing. Like, right now, we've talked about this off-air, and, you know, plenty of conversation has been going on about how the format feels really weird right now. Things feel really powerful. We're actually going to have Carmen from Pittsburgh on in a couple of weeks to talk about Lost Format for kind of that reason. Like, format feels weird right now. Like, it doesn't feel as good to play as it did even a year ago. Like, you've got all this really powerful stuff that just kind of, like, overwhelms the board and throws a bunch of damage and like if you didn't cancel in deck one then you kind of lose the game so to play a format that's very different and give you a different way to look at the game and also an opportunity to play cards that are maybe a little more low powered because i mean for me anyway i think low powered formats are more fun just because they require you to you know think about your plays more 
And the game lasts longer at that point, too. Yeah, the game isn't four turns long, you know? it's it, 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 I, I think that this kind of a format where you can play something that's different and isn't, you know, you're not playing into eight salvage quints again or overlord again or alice again or gura again you know it's like it's not you're playing into one of the four. don't you like playing into alice it's so much fun they have 10 caves you know like as someone who like intentionally sleeved up answers to alice like i don't hate facing alice but man it does get old after a little while in draft everything matters you know like i got a level one bay combo which i'm pretty sure i played wrong but it's something yeah, I drafted the card because it was blue, and so, like, and then I read it later because I'm like, oh, I'm drafting blue today. Oh, here's a cool blue card with a red bubble on it that I need to look at later. And that's, you know, that's what that's what ends up happening, you know? And then a level zero combos become so much better. Those are fun because they print a lot of whack stuff at zero to try to get you, like, to try to bait you into playing them because zeros are so inconsistent any other time. Well, okay, I say that, but I, I hear that's changing. Yeah, there are a couple of level zero combos that are starting to, like, potentially see some play, not just in Escanor. Yeah, like, the the fact that you can, like, actually play the Fauna level zero. I don't think there's another format where you can play that level zero Fauna combo, because it's not a good combo. But in draft, it feels awesome to throw the Fauna into the back row on turn one, and then just every time you slam a CX, you plus one. Mm -hmm. It's awesome, because the plusing is rarer. But the game also doesn't feel super random either. It's not lower power and therefore more random. It's lower power and therefore you the choices you make in drafting are much, much more important. But also the games are really close. Like all there was I didn't play a single game that was just a blowout, right? Because everyone's kind of in the same boat. Like everyone only has, you know, out of their 36 cards, maybe 10 or 12 actual good cards. Mm -hmm. So everyone's kind of in the same boat where it's like you're trying to find, you know, that little bit of extra tech that's actually useful. You know, maybe you're just loading up on soul triggers, you know, just to try to push damage. Like there are, you know, and there there are ways that you can draft and strategies and like the more you know the set, maybe the better you can draft it, right? Like, you know, maybe if you see the fauna, then you go, okay, like I I, I take the fauna, you know, pack one card one maybe. And then it's like, okay, I'm building around this. How do I, what do I need to do to get this card, right? So I'm like, anything that searches, I'm taking, you know, anything that can, you know, potentially get that card out of my grave and into my hand. Like I'm, t I'm taking that, you know, so you can actually start to build a synergy, build a strategy around some of the cards you got right off rip. So I'd be really curious to see like what, because, you know, for the Hollow Life draft, I think only really, I know you'd looked at some of the cards, I think Trung had was aware because he opened his case but like some of the other guys you know no idea what they're opening so i'd be curious okay what does a second round of drafting look like for some of these lads you know hey now with this knowledge from my first draft what do i what does my decks look like the second time am i getting able to build smarter that second time around well if you want if you want to run a second hollow live draft let me know i will be there oh excellent i'll let you know it's a fun format it's really good it's uh it's worth checking out. It's a great way to open product. It's a great way to introduce yourself to a new set. And it's also a great way to just play cards you've never gotten to play before. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of draft. And I hope that maybe it starts to pick up a little bit. It's not even hard to find sets to draft. Like Hollow Live is a massive set, but you can draft pretty much any set as long as it has, you know, I mean, obviously, the bigger the set, I think the more fun it would probably be to draft. Like, Azure Lane is going to be a great draft. Spy Family is going to be a great draft. There are definitely sets coming up that are going to be super good. And you could even draft, like, sequel sets, right? Like, if, fingers crossed, we get another Konosuba set someday, like, you can draft that set. You don't need any of the previous sets to draft it. Like, it just works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I would totally agree. I think the, the biggest thing I wanted out of draft was, like, hey, a new set came out. How can I familiarize myself with it? regardless of what else is out beforehand. Like, I considered drafting Overlord, but we got our title cup coming up. Not a title cup, our shop challenge coming up. So it's like, ah. And then there's regionals pretty quick after that, so it's not, like, a good time for it. But, yeah, in general, like, I think any set within reason could be drafted. Because even if it's a horrible draft, okay, well, the guy next to you just drafted just as horribly. So you're both just going to body each other for a second, potentially. And if the set is bad, well, everyone's drafting from the same bad set. Exactly. It's all from the you know, same the, pile. The, 
exactly the pool of cards hasn't you know didn't wasn't magically better for somebody else mm-hmm. so but yeah that's that's kind of draft format in a nutshell hopefully more people start picking it up because it's a really fun way to play weiss it's a really great way to get into these new sets um and maybe you know give us something that looks a little bit different as the meta you know kind of sorts itself out as we head into bcs brandon thank you very much for being on here anything that you want to plug uh nothing particular i want to plug at the moment no just go play some draft weiss I, it's pretty fun if you live in the midwest and you want to come and hang out with us at Legend Sports and Games in Grand Rapids, we play on Saturdays, usually at 5.30. Mm-hmm. We have uh, a Discord, so if you want more information, leave a comment and we'll get you connected. It's up in Grand Rapids. It's a good shop, pretty solid group of people that come out and play, really nice people, and some really good players are there as well. So it's a lot of fun if you want to play Weiss and you live in the Midwest. Legend Sports and Games in Grand Rapids, Michigan is a good place to do it. Once again, Brandon, thank you so much for being here. We'll be back on Thursday with, I think it'll be five cards, five minutes. Brandon will have a deck tech for Overlord next Tuesday. We'll have gameplay for that the following Thursday. And then in two weeks, another clock talk. Till next time, thank you so much for joining us. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And have a good one.